you know, when I think about Jim singing that song, uh, you know, he said, we need a little culture. Well, you know, I sound just like that in the shower. I, I want you to know that. <laughs> he broke out into that song, and I think, yeah, that... <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 30 says, We are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we ask your help again as we look at these verses and then look at other verses in Ephesians chapter 6 that our hearts might be attentive as well as our ears to the things that you have to say. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. We won't uh, elaborate too long on, on all that could be said about the relationship of husband and wife. There is a doctrinal thing, though, that, that we had our scripture reading uh, on it last week and again this week. Uh, concerning that statement when Paul talks about the oneness that we have with Christ. Verse 30, we're members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. That is, we who have, no, have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, God the Holy Spirit has placed us into Christ, and God says we are the body of Christ. So much so that that verse says we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We're joined with Christ. It says, for this cause, and now it quotes back in Genesis what God, when God first instituted marriage, even before the fall. For this cause shall a man leave his father and, his mo and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Just like we, when we trust Christ as our Savior, become one with him, so when a man and, and wife, a one, man and woman, leave their parents and join unto themselves, they become one flesh. Uh, verse 32 just takes us back again it says this is a great mystery but I seek speak concerning Christ in the church that statement when he says but I speak concerning Christ in the church many think that the great mystery is, is that the church is the bride of Christ uh, when they read the book of Revelation they realize that there's a statement there concerning the second coming of Christ that that Christ is coming back for his bride and uh, Paul uses two references we looked at one before in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where the Apostle Paul talks about presenting us as a chaste virgin to Christ. And, uh, and, and so some people look at that and say, well, see, that when Christ comes back, we're going to be married to him. And then they take this verse that would say that, that, that he's really not speaking about marriage. The great mystery is that he's speaking about Christ in the church, the great marriage that there's gonna, that's going to take place at the coming of Christ. What they, what they do in stating that, by the way, you'll find many hymns in our hymn book, and every once in a while you'll find us singing one that will name, called the church, the bride. And uh, what they're doing is there's many passages in the scripture that talk about the bride of Christ, but there is among oh, historians, uh, not historians, but theologians of the past, there's been a real serious error made for centuries. And that is to think that God, when he cut off the nation of Israel, turned to us Gentiles, and that we are now spiritual Jews, and that God is going to fulfill all his promises to Israel with us, and that's how they end up saying we're the bride of Christ. No, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. When God made some promises to the nation of Israel, he'll fulfill them with the nation of Israel. What God's doing in the age of grace, he's postponed his dealings with Israel until a future time in which after this age is over, he'll fulfill his promises to Israel. In the meantime, he's doing something else. He's creating the church, which is his body, and hence what the verses are saying there in Ephesians. Uh, let me just show you some of the Old Testament passages about the bride of Christ, and, and some of them are just, frankly, I'm just showing you just for interest. Look at Ezekiel, where we read last week, chapter 16. And I just say this to you so that you'll think twice before you call the church the bride of Christ. And then, as, as well, there's a, a deeper reason for showing you that, and I'll, I'll save that for just a second. It says in Ezekiel chapter 16, and we read it a couple weeks ago, so I, I don't want to reread it, uh, because what this is, is this is about how God chose out the nation of Israel. It begins in the beginning of the chapter, saying, uh, verse 1, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. 
Now, Jerusalem is, has now turned from God, and, and so God is going to speak to the prophet about the things that they've done sinfully. But it says in verse 3, And say, and he's going to go right back to the beginning, Thus saith God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity was in the land of Canaan. That's not a good land, folks. That was a perverse land. Thy father was an Amor Amorite, and, and thy mother a Hittite. That's not good heritage. As for thy nativity, in the day that thou was born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. And isn't that what you do with a baby? You clean up a baby and you hold the baby close and let it know that you love it? They didn't even cut the umbilical cord. They just took Israel when it was born and threw it off to the side. It's an aborted baby is what you're reading about there. Someone that no one loved, and yet God chose to love them. Verse 6, it says, And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thy own blood, I said unto thee, When thou was in thy blood, live. Yet I said, Yea, I say unto thee, When thou was in thy blood, live. And I caused thee to multiply as the buds of the field. And thou was increased and waxed great, and thou wast become... Uh, come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou was naked and bare. And when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, the time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thee, thy, thy nakedness, nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord, and thou becamest mine. So he took her, and he cleaned her up, and he made her great, and at what came time, he covenanted himself to join himself to her. He married Israel. Verse 9 says, Then I washed thee with water. And that amazes me, because that's exactly what Paul said that a husband is to do with his wife. Washed by the washing of water by the word. And that's after God marries her. He gives her the word and cleanses her. It says, I washed thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee. I anointed thee with oil. And then it goes on to talk about how he clothed her and decked her and made her great. And if you don't read down through the passage, when the nation of Israel finally was so content in her greatness, she looked at her own beauty and thought that she was great because of herself. And then she went out and sought out other gods and turned, her, turned herself away from God and become unfaithful to God. To such a point, God had to judge the nation of Israel. And that's the history of the nation of Israel. God judged her for, for departing from him. Does that mean he's done with Israel forever? We'll look at the same chapter. After you're done with the judgment, it says in verse 59, For thus saith the Lord God, I will even deal with thee as thou hast dealt, as thou hast done. So he's going to deal with her sin, which thou hast despised the oath in breaking the covenant. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth, and I will establish unto you an everlasting covenant. So God says, you might have become unfaithful, but I will punish you, and then I will keep my covenant with you, and I will be faithful to you. And what you have is the punishment upon Israel culminates in the tribulation period, which is described in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 19, he comes back to the nation of Israel as she is now cleansed and prepared to be his bride again. Come back, come over with me to our other scripture reading, Isaiah chapter 61. That's just before Ezekiel by two books. Uh, three books. Just before that is the book of Isaiah. And look at chapter 61 where we had our scripture reading today. This is the covenant that God made with the nation of Israel. Look at verse 10 of chapter 61. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garment of salvation. He hath covered me with a robe of righteousness. So he's cleansed the nation of Israel. As a bride decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. For as the earth, shall, uh, earth, uh, for as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring, spring forth before all the nations. Now, if you're not dealing with Israel, everything outside of Israel is the nations. And so before the nations, they're going to see Israel blossom. Verse 5, uh, uh, chapter 62, verse 1 says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake will I not rest till righteousness 
uh, till the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof un, uh, un, uh, as a lamp that burneth. Drop down to verse 4. It says, Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land be called any more desolate, but thou shalt be called his of Ba, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, that's what Hizabeth means, and, uh, uh, and thy land shall be married. That's what Beulah means. So that's what they're going to be called. Why? Verse 5 says, For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall my sons, be marry, shall my sons marry thee. And as a bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so will God rejoice over thee. So God is going to come back. Now, some... If you want to study the bride and, and all of that a little further, there is an interesting thing that keeps popping up here. There's not only uh, God being joined again with the nation of Israel in his covenant with her, but there's also God joining himself to the land of Israel and Israel themselves, the sons of God, coming back to the land. And when you look at that, sometimes you get a little confused on when you say the bride is Israel. Well, what, what do you mean Israel? Uh, is some Israel coming back to the land to be married to the land and Christ coming back to be joined to uh, another group in Israel. And, and sometimes when you look at it, it might be more, more accurate to say that in the second coming of Christ that he's joining himself to the remnant believers. And so you could say the bride of Christ is the, the remnant believers of the nation of Israel at the second coming of Christ. But then in other places, when you read about the, the new heaven and new earth and the new Jerusalem that's going to be here, there's a marriage that takes place which is to the land. And when you look at all those things, what, what's happening is God, through Christ, is coming back to join himself to the nation of Israel and to their land and bring in an everlasting covenant. And all of that is tied into the, those statements about the bride. One last, let's look at Revelation chapter 19 that I told you is the fulfillment of it. Revelation chapter 19, it says in verse 7, now the heavens are rejoicing in the previous verses, verses 11 through 16 is the return of Christ to rule and to reign, verse 7 says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the li fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And, with, and it was said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And then he fell, falls down on his feet to worship an angel, and, he, and he's instructed not to worship an angel. Uh, by the way, that, that makes it real clear, you worship God only. And worshiping Jesus Christ is worshiping God. Uh, but, but nonetheless, you see at the second coming of Christ, he's coming and there's a marriage supper, a feast is going to take place as Christ comes and joins himself to the nation of Israel and returns to that land. And all those verses describe what the Bible would call the bride of Christ. None of those speak about you and I. And here's the deeper understanding of all of that. The bride, the marriage takes place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's when Jesus Christ will be joined in covenant relationship permanently forever with the nation of Israel. What Paul says is the great mystery is that I am bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. I am joined with Christ now. And that's, that's the thing that Paul is trying to make us understand in Ephesians chapter 5. Not that we shall be the bride of Christ. We're not a bride at all. We're already one with him because we're part of his body. We're not someone else that he is going to join himself to. It's something that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, that God in this age of grace has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and he already placed us in his Son, and we are already one with Christ. That's the great mystery of Ephesians chapter 5, and that's why if you, if you start thinking of us as the bride and you're looking at something future rather than rejoicing in the great mystery of what God's done today in the age of grace. And, and that's, the, that's the deeper reason for, for understanding that we're not the bride of Christ at the second coming of Christ. We're to enjoy and appreciate who God has made us in Christ now. And we are already bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh and part of his body, members of his body. 
And we have that blessed blessing now all because of the grace of God and the riches of his grace. So Ephesians chapter 5, that has some practical implications that I'd like to also talk to you about. Ephesians chapter 5, that's what Paul's saying in verse 30 when it says, For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bone. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And that's what he's saying. We've already been joined unto him. But you know, this, this relationship of going back and forth is now telling us that this is that the relationship that we have with Christ as one with him is the same relationship that a man and wife have when they've joined themselves together in holy matrimony. That's why it says over there in Revelation in, in Matthew chapter 19, what God hath joined together. God instituted marriage, folks. When you leave your father and mother, you join unto the wife. The Bible says you become one flesh. Who made you one flesh? God did. And what God hath joined together, the Bible says, let no man put asunder. When you look at this and you re begin to realize that the great mystery is our oneness with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, just like he'll be faithful to Israel, is faithful to you and I. We'll always be one with him. Now you, can, you and I might question our faithfulness to him because we're not quite that faithful. But he is that faithful to us. And I'd like you to see it in this verse. Come over to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter... It is 2 Timothy, chapter 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. On your own, you can read Romans, chapter 8, and realize that you're one with, with Christ. Romans 8 ends with the, the great uh, exclamation of... of uh, of us never being separated from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're one with him never to be separated. You can count on God for that. Uh, when you come to 2 Timothy, though, you read this, not though, in, in, in the, on the same lines you read this. Verse 11 says, it is a faithful saying. Faithful is something you can count on. It is a faithful saying. Uh, if we be dead with him, and that's when we trust Christ, we're identified with his death, burial, and resurrection, realizing when he died, he died for me. When we trust him, we're placed into that death. And it says, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Just as sure as Christ came out of that grave, you're going to come out of a grave someday, unless the Lord comes and takes you while you're yet alive. If we suffer, with, if we, suffer we shall also reign with him. There's rewards that we have when we go to heaven someday. And if we're willing to suffer now for him, we'll be glorified, we'll, be, we'll be, receive a, a, a weight of glory for that. If we deny him, choose not to suffer for him now, live in denial of who he has made us in Christ, he will deny us. And that, when it comes to a reigning position, you won't get it. Will you get to heaven? Yeah, there's a faithful saying. If you're dead with him, you will live with him. In case you didn't get it, look at verse 13. If we believe not, and that is to absolutely become unfaithful to him. That's what infidelity is about, unfaithfulness. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Why is that? We've been made one with him. Even if we become unfaithful to him, he'll never become unfaithful to us, to us because he won't deny himself. He's made us one with him, and he's not about to cut part of his body off and cast it from himself. He's made us one with him. We're forever one with him, and we have that now, and that is the great mystery. But that is also the parallel that the Apostle Paul is making toward a man and a wife and the marriage relationship. Uh, I'm reminded what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 about being stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required that a man be found faithful. And, you know, when you talk about these, the great mystery and you talk about the, the, the faithfulness of Christ, then you realize that in our marriage, this is what God is calling on us for. Fidelity in marriage, the number one ground that holds marriage together. The number one thing that you owe to your mate and you covenant with your mate and you promise to your mate to be faithful unto them until death do you part. You break that unfaithfulness, you're breaking the very foundation of marriage. Now, God will never break his unfaithfulness with us. We can count on that. That's a wonderful thing. But you know, when you enter into marriage, you better think, and you better think real deep. 
how important it is to be faithful to the mate. Because once that faithfulness is broken, the very foundation of marriage is broken. And it's really going to ca cause someone to become real strength, have the real strength of God and the real grace of God to hold the marriage together when a mate has become unfaithful. It's the very foundation of it all. And it's required among stewards that a man be found faithful. But, you know, in, the, in this thing, this great mystery, if the, if the marriage is a picture of how we are joined together, where is there room for divorce in this? Do you see it? If, if, Christ, if Paul is making an analogy of the oneness that we have with Christ is the same oneness that God says is in marriage, where is there room for divorce? And frankly, there is none. If we're unfaithful, he stays faithful. Are you ever let off the hook? Are you ever, can you ever look at marriage and say, well, the thing just isn't working out? There's no room for it. That's the, that's, that's the teaching here in Ephesians, is there's no room for divorce. Now, does it happen? Yes, it happens. What if it happens? Well, that's a whole other question. And I don't even want to deal with that now. We'll deal with it when we deal with Corinthians, because it happened there. But you need to know, first of all, that in this, in this relationship, the marriage is related to Christ and the church, is that there really is no room for divorce in, Christian, in the Christian life. And, and it's something, it's a commitment for life, and uh, it's not in the program for believers. So we conclude in verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife. So husbands... If that's the relationship you have, I'm back in Ephesians 5:33. If that's the relationship we have, then husbands love your wives. Make her the the object of your love. Be totally committed unto her. And it says, uh, uh, even as himself, because she's one with you. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now you know the reverence of your husband. The, the Bible speaks about in in, Revel, in Romans chapter 13 about a. Uh, an officer of the law being a minister of God. Don't they like to call ministers reverend all the time? And we stay away from that term because you don't reverence man, especially in a holy, you look at a man and think he's some kind of holy person and so you call him reverend. You don't reverence man. The Bible says not to think about man above what the Bible has said about him, and that is that he's a sinner. He's not holy. If he's holy, it's only because he's in Christ, but not, not in his practical walk of life. So you don't walk around looking at people and addressing them reverend. And, and, and look at this when it says, Woman, wife, see that she reverence her husband. Uh, it doesn't say call him reverend. <laughs> so the men start pointing this out and say, hey, I'm your, I'm your husband, call me reverend. Uh, it doesn't say call him reverend, but you have that attitude toward him. You're to reverence him. Reverence has to do with worship and fear, uh, not in the sense of idolizing, but in the sense of the position that God has given him, uh, him in the family as the wife is to reverence her husband, realize that position that he has, and, and, and under God, whole, uh, view him that way. Uh, I like one last verse far, as far as husbands are concerned, and I like, especially the men, to turn to Joshua chapter 24. A verse of scripture that sometimes you can see in the Christian bookstores written on a plaque, and it is a nice verse to put on a plaque and a nice verse to hang up in the house. The place you need to hang this, men, is in your heart, and you need to realize your responsibility before God, as we've studied in the book of Ephesians, is to be the head, the spiritual leader of that home. And Joshua challenged the nation of Israel about their future before he died, and he can't speak for everybody, but he can speak for himself, and he makes a statement that every man needs to stop and make a commitment to God, to his family, and one not to put a plaque on a wall, but make it a reality in the home. And that is Joshua chapter 24 in verse 15. Joshua 24 verse 15. It says, If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. You know, you serve somebody. We'll look at a verse in, in Romans in a little bit that will tell you you're going to serve somebody. You're either going to serve Satan, you're going to serve God. You're going to serve the flesh, or you're going to serve the Lord. You're going to serve somebody. And so Joshua says, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, 
or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I do believe a man makes a decision for his family, not only for himself, but he makes a decision for his family. And that decision is, a, this is a public declaration that Joshua made. I'm not too good with public declarations, but I would call the men here to make a public declaration, not now, not, not in front of me, but in, in especially not me. I think it needs to be made in the family. I think you need to make it in your heart first, you need to make it before the Lord, and then you need to tell your family, look, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he's not speaking about himself, is he? My wife is going to serve the Lord with me, my children are going to serve the Lord with me, and the only way to ever get out of that is you're not with me. And a wife is not to be, be anything but reverent to her husband, she's supposed to be there as the help me to serve the Lord. And the kids, you have no room for rebellion. You're to be under your father's leadership, and you're going to serve the Lord. But that, that determination has to be made, and then, then it has to be fulfilled by leadership. The man is the leader in that home, so not only has he got to say it, then he's got to show them how to serve the Lord. And when they see the man of the house serving the Lord, the family will follow. So Joshua, the great leader of Israel, talked about his home and how they would serve the Lord. Now come back with me to Ephesians, and now we'll look into chapter 6. Appropriately, following what we just said, Ephesians chapter 6 says this, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, you know, I just read those verses, and I realized something here, that it says children. I read, realized it before I said this. Uh, but if it says children, then all the eyes that are on me, all these adult eyes upon me, well, you can listen to what we have to say. But, you know, when God addresses Gentiles, he means Gentiles. When he addresses Jews, he means Jews. When he addressed the wife, he meant the wife. When he addressed the husband, he meant the husband. When he addressed children, he means children. If there's a child sitting next to you without a Bible open, could you open one up and show them these verses? Make sure every child has a Bible open right now because there's no sense me standing here and I'm not even going to get through but verse 1 of chapter 6 and there's no sense me standing here with a bunch of adults and telling them how to be children. They don't need to be children anymore. They need to be adults. So from this point on in my message today, it's just for the children. Now, I thought about letting the adults leave, but the kids are afraid you'll eat the dinner before they get home. And uh, so I'm going to make you stick around too. When we, when we talked about the wives, the husbands wanted to hear what I was going to say to the wives or what God has to say to the wives. When, when we address the, the husbands, I know the wives want their husbands here to hear what the Bible says to them about being a husband. And I know adults want to hear what God has to say to children. But God is speaking directly to you children. So uh, make sure everyone has a Bible open. Do you have a Bible open? All the kids, say amen. We'll wait. Amen, we've got a couple. You all have a Bible open. Now, you know, I think it's an amazing thing when you think about it that God who created the world, and I know you must at night look up into those stars and see those stars, and God says that when you look at those stars, you're seeing his eternal power in Godhead. You're realizing how great and how big God is. Those guys go in those spaceships and they travel, at, at, I forget how many thousands of miles an hour, and it takes them a long time. They finally get to the moon, and that's the closest thing close to us. All the other planets are even further away and the stars are even farther and farther away than that. And God who created all of that and put that up there wants to speak to you when he says children. Isn't that amazing? God wants to talk to you. Boy, you better listen. Realize in this verse, God has something to say to you. And you know, when you look at the verse, and if you just look at the first two verses, out of everything God would have to say in the whole universe when he talks to you, you children, He's got just two particular things to say. What are they? Children, what are they? If you look at those verses, God has two things to say to children. Can someone tell me what they are? An adult can help them you can, with your own kid. What two things does God have to say to children? Okay, the first one says, children, obey your parents. Just 
forget the rest of the verse right now. That's what he wants to say to you. The second thing he wants to say to you is honor your father and mother. If God had anything to say to you, that's what he wants to say to you. Those, are, those things are very important to God, aren't they? They're not something to be taken lightly. God would speak out of heaven, wrote down a book, preserved it for years so you could have it so God would know that he wants you to know that you're to obey your parents. And then the second thing is that you're honor your father and mother. Now, I, get, I better say something here because I'm making all these eye contacts and some of these kids, they're taller than me. <laughs> and we use the term kid. The Bible doesn't have like three terms. It doesn't say uh, children, young adults, and adults. The Bible don't have terms like that. It, it, deals with, it, it deals with children and then it deals with adults. There's just the two. So you say, well, where's the child? Now, I might be 18 or I might be taller than my dad. I got my own car. I can do what I want. Uh, what, what's a child? Well, we're not going to look at the verse, but I'll tell you in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it tells you what a child is. You're a child until your dad says you're not a child. <laughs> so if you have a dad and he's still paying your bills and you're still living in his home and you're still taking, he's still taking care of you, you're still a child. He'll tell you when you're an adult. And until he said you're an adult, you're a child. Now, that, now that's what the Bible says, that the, man, the father determines when a, perth, when a child is no longer considered a child, but considered an adult. And therefore, then there's some adult responsibilities that they would have once they become an adult, but God says uh, that the father determines that. So really, we're talking about children that are still in home, but, but quite of age. And God would say to you to obey your parents, for it's right in the Lord, and then to honor thy father and mother. You know, God is concerned with authority. Turn back with me to Romans and, and put a marker there. And this is, not just, this is not just the adults. Young people, put a marker in Ephesians, but come back to Romans. I want to show you something. Because when you say obey, if that's what God has to say, you need to realize that authority is something that's very important to God. It's something that God wants you to, to realize you have authority above you. And therefore, you're to be obedient to. Now, that authority, it all starts with the child realizing his parent is the authority. But, you know, when we talk about some of these driving cars and all, you know, it's not long that you begin to realize, you know, my parent's not the only authority. You're first sent to school, and all of a sudden, the teacher tells you, sit down, be quiet, go to the principal. And all of a sudden, you realize, hey, there's some other people got authority over me. And then, then you get a driver's license. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> Wings. You drive down the street, and the siren goes on, the policeman pulls you over and says, let me see your license. Where are you going? See the judge. Next thing you know, you, hey, there's other authority over me. Romans chapter 13, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For, the, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. God is the one who instituted that there be law and order in society. God established the right for man to make rules and disciplines in society because God is very interested in order. And in order to keep order, there has to be authority. And the first authority that you ever experience in life is your parents. But after that, you begin to realize there's other authorities that God says that we're to be subject to and when they exercise that authority, he gave them the right to exercise that authority. So then you have to learn how to be under the authority of government. Well, it's, it's not long that when you, when you continue under that kind of authority that eventually you say, well, I, I want to be married. And as soon as you get married, God speaks to the wife and says, now, you need to be submissive to your husband. He's the head of the wife. So now there's another authority in your life. And the man says, I'm the head of my home. And he thinks there's no authority. And then the Bible tells him that Christ is your head. And then he realizes, uh-oh, I only have headship in this family to rule as God would have me to rule in this family. And my, uh, my authority doesn't go beyond that. And so you realize there's this chain of command, this chain of authority, because ultimately the authority, the one who establishes all authority, is God. And what you learn from the very beginning, when you learn to obey parents, you're beginning to obey the authority that God put above you. And then you'll eventually learn how to obey the government that God put above you. 
And then you'll be able to see in the home, hopefully, wives who know their position in the home and are voluntarily submissive to their husband because the Lord said to, and so they're as of the Lord, they, they do what, what they're, they're asked to do in, in helping and raising the family and being submissive to the husband. And then they look all the way to the top of their family and they see their dad. And does their dad obey authority? Does their dad acknowledge God's authority in his life? And all the time they're seeing authority being done. And God is very interested in authority. For a child, it starts all the way there. It starts with obeying the parents. And so God says to you children, obey your parents. Uh, and those parents, you realize there's an example to be set. Now kids, let me say something to you that you're probably <laughs> used to hearing. Uh, maybe not used to hearing, but there, I know, I, I can see it. There is excuses that are given all the time for not obeying authority, uh, especially if you look at the next thing that says in the Lord, and some people think that they can get away from and become disobedient because, well, maybe it's not in the Lord. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But what I mean is there's excuses. People are telling you today that if you are, are, are rowdy and you are misbehaving, that it might not be your fault. It might be the way you were raised. Your mom might not have gave you a pacifier when you were a baby and you screamed and you cried and you never got your way and now you're just screaming out throughout the rest of your grown up years looking for authority and you really what you wanted is to be pacified when you were a child and they give you excuses. Perhaps they tell you that you were raised in a broken home and you don't have a father in your home or you don't have a mother in your home and, and therefore you have every right to rebel and be angry because it's deep anger right within. Did God say it was okay? Did this verse say, obey your parents in the Lord uh, if they've been good to you and gave you a pacifier and, and have been a perfect example to you? No, don't say that. This, this verse in, in Ephesians 5 says to obey your parents in the Lord. And so don't be looking for an excuse not to obey your parents. The Bible says that you are to obey your parents and you can help yourself and you can obey God. When it says in the Lord, that phrase in the Lord especially means that if you are in the Lord, though everything we're studying is about being filled with the Holy Spirit, you know who gets the Holy Spirit? Young people, you know who gets the Holy Spirit? Those who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have honestly believed in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, the Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit wants to control you. The Holy Spirit can be in control. When people say that you have a reason not to be in control, if you're in the Lord, you can be controlled of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would be telling you it's right to do what your parents say. And therefore, in the Lord means to be, if, if you're in the Lord, to obey your parents, that you are to obey your parents as if they are the Lord. Because it's the Lord who put them above you. And, and that's what it means to obey your parents in the Lord. And then the Bible says that this is right. Uh, obey. What does obey mean? Well, obey means to, 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 to respond to action, to do, do what they said. It means to, that when the parents say to do something, that you do it. It, it, it. Obey, you're told to do something, and you do it. Come over with me. You're, you're, I asked you to hold Romans. Look at chapter 6. Now, we're not going to go too long. Romans chapter 6. Kids, you got Romans chapter 6 there? Young people, if you'd rather, do you have Romans chapter 6 there? He says some things here that I think will help you in understanding what obedience is. Verse 13 says, Neither yield your members, and that's your hands, your feet, your eyes, all of that, all the parts of your body, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. You know, you're going to give in to do something. You're going to do something, aren't you? You're going to fill your time with something. You're going to do some kind of activity. The Bible says, don't yield to do sinful things. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You know what obedience is? It's yielding to do what's right. Your parents will tell you what's right, and that is their job to do that, but when they tell you what is right, what obedience is, is saying, okay, I will yield and do what's right. That, that's what obeying is. Verse 16 says it this way. 
Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, because when you obey, you're like a servant, aren't you? To whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servant ye are to whom you obey, whether it be unto sin, uh, sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. When you obey, you, if you obey sin, you're obeying what's going to lead to death in your life. And if you obey righteousness, to do righteous uh, unto God, to, to be obedient unto righteousness, then you're, you're serving the Lord. So obedience is to respond, it's to yield. But look at this verse, look at verse 17. It says, But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, now that's before you were saved, we all serve sin, we've all done things wrong, but, that, uh, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. In other words, when you obey from the heart what God said, you're yielding to God. My point in obedience is what you need to learn to do is to obey from your heart. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and the Holy Spirit is telling you the same thing God wrote down in this book. Obey your parents, for it's right. When the kids try tempting you to do sinful things, the Holy Spirit says, do what's right. And you know what you have to do? Not only obey and do what's right, God wants your heart to obey and do what's right. Down inside, he wants you to want to do right. And God, Holy Spirit, is working there. Ephesians chapter 5 says that when you got saved, God shed abroad his spirit in your heart. And you have God on the inside as well as his word on the outside telling you to do right. So don't let anyone tell you that you don't have to do right, that, there's no, that you have a good excuse to be disobedient and rowdy and, and ornery. No, you don't. You, you, have, you can obey because God told you to obey and God's helping you to obey. Now one last, and that is Colossians chapter 3. And that is one last for today. Not only does Ephesians 6.1 say, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. But Colossians chapter 3 in verse 20 adds one more thought. It says, Children, obey your parents. It says, In all things, that's like saying in the Lord, in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto God. Our number one purpose in all of our life is to make God pleased with us. Now, we won't always do things that make God pleased, but you know who did? The Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, came into the world, and God spoke out of heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God will see you in his Son, and he'll be pleased with you. But now he's telling you, now that you're my son, then walk pleasing to me. Please me in the way you live. And if a child is obedient unto the Lord, not only is he doing that which is right, but he is becoming well-pleasing unto the Lord. And young people, I say there's two things that you need to set in your heart today to do before God. Two things. Number one, in your heart. And that, that's, that's where God's working. That's the inner thoughts that you have. That's deep down inside what's talking to you. In your heart, determine to do what's right, right now. Later on, when the, when the evil people come along and tempt you, whether it's with cigarettes or whether it's with dope or whether it's with guns or whether it's evil things, they come along and tempt you. Don't decide then, I'll decide, because you won't be able to decide. You'll be so confused. You make a decision in your heart right now, I'm going to do what's right. And then do it from the heart, because the next thing God says, for it's well-pleasing unto the Lord, decide not only to do right, a lot of people do right, but only the believer, only the Christian can be pleasing unto the Lord. Decide you want to please God with your life. Now that'll keep you from an awful lot of problems. If you do those two things when you're very young, choose to do right, and then choose to please God with your life. I say that to you because next time we get together, we're going to talk about what if you don't choose to do that. What could happen to your life? What kind of misery and heartache? What kind of shame to your parents? Because the Bible talks about all those things. But today, God just simply says, obey. Make the right choice and make it from your heart. Let's pray. God, our Father, we do pray that 
that each person would listen and, and heed the, the statements that you make particularly toward them. Whether we address the husband today, whether we address the wife, or you address the child. Father, you spoke to each one. Others of us who, who maybe don't have a family at home anymore, we can realize the things that are right and encourage others to do right. Father, we pray that we'll realize that when we open this book that we're not to be debating whether we should or shouldn't, whether we feel like it or don't. But Father, when you speak, these are things that are right. No debate over it. We're to be obedient. Whether we're the husband under the headship of Christ, the wife under the headship of the husband, or the children under the leadership of the parents, Father, pray that each one would choose to do right and then and be just like what Joshua said about his home, that we will serve the Lord. Pray each child knows you as, as their God and Father and Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we pray every adult does too. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's just sing that chorus one more time. Yes, Jesus.